With fats, um, uh, I think we are, you know, we have come out of the era in which fat was demonized as the bad macronutrient. But that legacy is still very much with, with us. I still see that when people are telling, giving people nutritional advice, talking about weight control, I still see the emphasis on fatty foods and people talking about high fat foods and cutting down on fat consumption and low fat foods. Fat does not make you fat. No, this is a very important concept. Fat does not make you fat. What is driving the obesity epidemic in this country is the very high consumption of high glycemic load carbohydrate foods, which have been technically manipulated. We need fat in the diet, and you can have substantial amounts of fat in the diet. When you try to, get, when you try to lower fat, um, you know, when you get below 25% of calories, food rapidly gets uninteresting. You know, fat is the major conveyor of flavor to, the, to us because many of the flavor principles are fat soluble. Uh, fat also gives a pleasurable mouth feel. If you try to get fat down in the range of 10% of calories, which Ornish and Pritikin diets have recommended, I don't think people are going to stay on that unless you have a chef living with you or you live at a spa or you're so frightened about the prospect of an invasive cardiac procedure that you're going to do that. But that is very difficult to eat food like that. And it's not necessary. You know, in the Ornish program where he has demonstrated reversal of heart disease, he, he has never studied the dietary component apart from the other components of the program, which include moderate exercise, meditation, group support. I think if you, uh, you know, if you gave the, a Mediterranean diet or the anti-inflammatory diet, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment, as part of that same program, you'd get even better results and better compliance. Um, on the island of Crete, you know, one of the stellar areas for med traditional Mediterranean diet, people eat 40% of calories as fat, and they have very low rates of cardiovascular disease and cancer. But the fat that they're eating is mostly olive oil, fat from fish, and fat from high-quality uh, whole-fat dairy products. Uh, the fact is we need fat, and the most imp important kinds of fats that we need are the essential fatty acids. And here is another area which there has been an explosion of research. You know, we must have omega-6s and omega-3 fatty acids every day, and we have to have them in the right ratio. There, there, it has been estimated that in Paleolithic times, we're eating these two categories of fats in roughly equal quantities. Now we're eating a tremendous excess of omega-6s to omega-3s. There are many reasons for that. One is that omega-3 sources are very rare in nature. You know, it's mostly from oily fish. The vegetable sources of omega-3s, you can't really count one for your omega-3 needs because they're a short chain form ALA, which the body has to convert to DHA and EPA. That conversion is inefficient at best. It varies greatly um, depending on your genetics. Uh, and it is interfered with if there's a lot of omega-6 fatty acids in the diet. Um, the, but the main reason for the imbalance at present is that our diets have been flooded with new sources of omega-6 fatty acids. And I'll just mention two of them. The main one is refined soybean oil, which began to enter the food chain here in the 1920s. It is the universal fat that's used in processed, manufactured, technologically manipulated food. It's ubiquitous because it's cheap. It's cheap because the federal government artificially drives down the price of soy through its subsidies program. Um, that, the introduction of refined soybean oil has been the major reason for this tremendous imbalance in omega-6 to omega-3s. This has huge consequences in terms of inflammatory status, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, I usually tell people to avoid any food product that's got soybean oil as an ingredient. You know, that's a marker of low quality food. And this, by the way, is one of the things, you know, when we get political here, and I hope in the public forum, we should all be working immediately to end these federal subsidies to soy and corn, which are responsible for making some of the unhealthiest ingredients in our food cheapest and most available. And this is something that's got to be stopped. The other, another reason, which is less obvious for the increasing consumption of omega-6 fatty acids, is that the animals that we raise for meat were 
grazing animals that typically ate grasses not too long in the past. Grasses have low levels of omega-3 fatty acids in them. Cows eat tremendous amounts of them, so they build up omega-3 fatty acids in their fat. Now we fatten our cows on grains, which are omega-6 sources. So that omega-3 source has disappeared and be, been replaced by an omega-6 source. So this is the fact that people are eating a tremendous disparity of omega-6 fatty acids to omega-3 fatty acids. That's something that I think that's one of the most serious nutritional problems in our population is insufficient omega-3 intake. Huge consequences in terms of risks of, of uh, chronic disease related to inflammation. Um, I strongly recommend using olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, as a main fat. The research in olive oil is terrific. Um, not only does olive oil have a very good fatty acid profile, it's got a unique fraction of protective, health protective antioxidants in it. Uh, polyphenols, which are related to the polyphenols found in green tea um, and in other natural products. Um, in addition, and this fraction is delicate and easily damaged by oxidation. So this is a reason to get good quality extra virgin olive oil, to store it properly, not let it be exposed to light or air, not heat it to too high temperatures. Uh, one of the, in, an interesting compound that's been found in, in that fraction is called oleocanthal. Um, it's responsible for the peppery biting taste of good olive oil. And it has been shown to have anti-inflammatory power equal to that of ibuprofen. I mean, that's remarkable. And uh, uh, I attended some olive oil tastings in Italy uh, last year. Uh, since I have my name on a, a good brand of organic olive oil. And I had never done olive oil tasting before, and it's interesting to do this. So you, you put olive oil on a spoon and you slurp it into your mouth, mixing it with a lot of air, and get it, coat your mouth with it, and then spit it out. And when you're at olive oil tastings, you hear a lot of coughing. And good olive oils, at the very end of the, it's like some, at the very end of the taste, you often give you a catch in the throat, and sometimes this actually makes people cough, and some people experience this as a peppery bite. That is very desirable. That is the mark of a good olive oil that has, where this uh, polyphenol fraction has not been damaged, um, and you want that in your diet. So basically, you want to try to get people to not be afraid of fat. I think whole fat dairy products are much healthier than non-fat and low-fat dairy products, and they taste better. Um, I think that one of the great practical problems that came from this era the, the, of demonization of fat was that there was a proliferation of low-fat and non-fat foods on the market, which had even higher glycemic loads than the conventional versions of those, because often to make up for the reduction in taste and pleasure by taking fat out, people put more sugar in. And, uh, you know, just looking at what happened during this era, Americans got fatter. You know, as they ate more and more low-fat and non-fat foods, they got fatter. So something was very wrong with the way we were thinking.